Take your Bibles. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Who knows what the name Philadelphia means? Philadelphia. Okay, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Two people? Three people? Philadelphia. And it doesn't, if you say cream cheese, I'm kicking you out. <laughs> Philly, Philly cheesesteak. With or without? That's with onions or without onions. Yeah. Phila. Philos is a, is a word for love in Greek, and adelphon is the word for brother. So Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. There you go. And it's interesting that the Greeks put that together uh, because that is... One of the two commandments that Christ came to give us was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And um, it really reflects what a city, if you're going to have a, if you're going to have any kind of civilization, there has to be, number one, a fear and a respect of the law and, a, and a, a generalized love for your fellow citizens. Or else you'll be warring and fighting over everything. You'll be killing people. And that's what, that we see a deterioration in the American cities. And it's not just Chicago. It's New York. It's Los Angeles. San Francisco. It is everywhere. The deteriora deterioration. I hope I said that right of what cities and towns and villages, um, what holds them together is, number one, a fear of law and a respect for law and order and a generalized, and that's what the word philos means, a, a, just a general, I'm not going to hurt my neighbor's stuff kind of love. You love them enough to leave them alone. In other words, so Jesus is addressing now in verse seven, the angel of the church in Philadelphia. And he says unto the angel, verse seven of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. And then he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. And he said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Now go back up to what he said there in verse seven, when he said, these things saith he that is holy. And to me, it's just interesting. He introduces himself uh, in a different way to every one of these churches. The church at Sardis is he that hath the seven spirits of God. Uh, to the church um, at Thyatira, these things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. And here to Philadelphia, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. What is the key of David? Does anybody know the key of David? Well, we know who David is. David is, as always, a foreshadow of Christ, um, the one who put down all the enemies, the fierce warrior king, and everybody became afraid of David, uh, except for Saul. And um, so, yes, Gary, you have a thought on that. Right? Well, it could be. It could be. Um, I have this idea that every, every one of these significant men in the Bible are a 
are a character or a caricature of the nature of Christ, where David is a man after God's own heart, that would be Christ. Solomon with his profound wisdom, that would be Christ, the word of, the word of wisdom, and so on. And everybody's different character in the Bible, you put them all together and you have, you have the, the one Christ. Uh, but no, it's actually a reference to a verse of Scripture in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 22, turn there. Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament in this reference. And think of things in the Bible that are locked or sealed or shut or opened. Things like that. Think of something in the Bible that's locked. Something that is hidden. And who's the only one that can reveal? something that is bound up who's the only one that can release it things like that and I might ask you for some of those give me some examples I, that way I know you're just you're thinking and not just sitting there okay waiting for another cup of coffee maybe I should have had a cup this morning Isaiah I'm like sterling though since COVID I've lost my taste for coffee I know I should be thrown out of the country anyway Isaiah 22, verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And, and here again, this Eliakim is going to be a type of Christ. There's something about Eliakim that is a representation of Jesus Christ before Jesus ever shows up. Verse 21, it says, I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. Yes, guys wear girdles. They're called guidles. This is my day job. Strengthen him with thy girdle, and that's a belt, and will commit thy government into his hand. Uh, in Isaiah 9, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And in this case, I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David. So now we have another clue to it. It's the house of David. And ask the question, what does that mean then? It's more than just the key of David. It's the key to David's house. David was from a particular city. What was the name of that city? Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Judah, and Bethlehem means house of bread. So the house of David is all the lineage and who gets to be in David's house. And if you live in the house and are considered part of the family, then what happens when it's time for the inheritance to be given out? You get your portion of it. If you are a part of the house of whom the inheritor lives. If you are of his house, meaning of his loins, whether you were born that way or you were brought in and adopted to be that way, you were to be an inheritor of that man's house. And that's what I think is a reference here. If we go back to that verse in Revelation, he says, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David. So how is it that we can get the promises made to David? Promises of an everlasting kingdom. Promises, God said, I'll be your father and you shall be my son. Promises like that. How is it that we, as just Gentiles, not even born of the house of David, we're not even Jews. How is it that we can be possessors of that it is through Christ so think of when you read all of the promises like in the Old Testament or those in the Psalms and this is something I wrestled with years ago I would I would be reading through the Psalms and I'd be reading all these great promises but I would say to myself Mike you're too wicked you're 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 sinful you you don't deserve those things God's not going to give those to you because you don't deserve them well that part's true Guarantee you it's true. But the truth of it is also 
that if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, who is it that has the key to the house of David? It's Jesus Christ. So Jesus was the son of David. So he is a direct descendant of the lineage of David. And David, of course, was king. So that means Jesus has the right to succession to the throne. He has the right to the house. Okay? And, and no, other, no other person in the world has that right except Jesus Christ. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay? Who do you give a key to your house to? <clears throat> Nobody. Not nowadays, except maybe the people that live there. Okay? Caleb had his first experience the other day. He uh, told Lisa and I that he was going to the gym. So he went to the gym here in town, drove all the way back home, had to quick change and shower and go to work. He gets home, the house is locked. He didn't have his key. So he was going to, Lisa said, I guess we'll have to drive all the way to Hillsboro and open up the house for him. So we had actually turned around and was headed that way. And he called back and he said, the window's open. So he crawled through the window. So we got him another key. And I said, I'm going to watch you put it on your key ring. That way, when you walk out of the house with your car keys, you know, you got your house key with you. Yep, can't get in the house without the key, right? So to me, that's, that's the part of the meaning of it. He has the key of David, or the key, here in this case, the key of the house of David. So now Christ is the one who can let us enter in. Because he and he only. Did he give the keys to the Pope? To Peter, to Muhammad, Buddha, no, no other, no other name among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus Christ. Mary doesn't even have the keys, does she? It's not Mary, it's not the Pope, it wasn't Peter, it was always Jesus. It was foretold in the Old Testament that it was going to be Jesus. Jesus making the proclamation now. I have the house of the key of David. I will let in who I will let in. I will put out, I will shut out who I will shut out. And that's what he's, we'll get to that here in a little bit. So verse 22 again, the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, which is interesting. And I don't know quite what the meaning is. But you have a bone in your shoulder called the clavicle. Do you know why you have a bone in your shoulder called the clavicle? Clavicle is a word that means key. And if you think about it, you remember the old skeleton keys? Why did they call them that? Because they imitated the shoulders and the spinal column. This is why this bone across here is called the clavicle because these bones with the spinal column looks like a key. Okay? Now, I don't know exactly what that means. I just think it's significant. Somehow, some way, I'll figure it out one of these days. Anyway, the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, literally his clavicle. So he shall, so he shall open and watch this. Who can shut it if Christ opens it? None. So if you're reading this book, the Holy Spirit's sitting there in the chair with you, and you see something, and God enlightens your mind, and lifts you up and blesses you, and gives you those little shivers, like you do when you find something neat in the Bible, or God's opened your eyes to something. If the Holy Ghost has given that to you, if Christ has given that to you, can any man take it away from you? No, this is why I say there is a difference between what I say and how I say it and what God says and how he says it. 
If you believe a certain thing simply because I said it, or I think I'm, I can give you proof of why I believe what I believe, that somebody else can unsay it in your mind. And I've seen that happen hundreds of times where people would leave me one day and then not believe me the next because somebody else told them something different. But if God says it to you and God puts it in you, it's there. And it's not going anywhere. It's just, it is as genuine as the rock that the church is built on and that rock is Jesus Christ and that is the sure foundation of our salvation is as sure as our salvation once God me me asking the internet whether the King James is right is not the same as me asking God whether it's right because when God answered me then God spoke it and I believed it instantly no argument I surrendered to it that was I'll never forget that day as long as I live and that's a part of what he means by that so shall he open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open so think about this Ephesians 1 says that we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise I did a study of that word in the Bible uh, years ago. Just chase the word sealed, seal, uh, sealing anything that had to do with the word seal. And all of a sudden you start seeing how verses group together. And you see that things that are sealed are, number one, are things that are preserved. Things that are sealed are things that are kept in store for a later time and so on. Um... So if you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, can any man come along and unseal it? No. Back, and they, I guess they still do this. In fact, we do it. Uh, we have a, a little thing in, on Rose's desk that crimps paper. We have an official seal of this church. And it was made... I found it in my desk when I took over it was made I don't know how many years ago but uh, we've been asked by banks and different places that wanted a letter from our church that it had to have a seal of our church on it or some form of seal from our church and we have that thing there where we crimp the paper and it's got the seal of Bethel Church and our incorporation number and everything like that it's got that in it that shows an official designation from our church Think about all the meanings of that. We have a book in God's right hand that's sealed with seven seals. Meaning that part of the meaning is it came directly from God and there's no mistaking it. Kings had their own seal. They had their own sign, their own signet. Sometimes it was in the form of a ring. In the book of Esther, uh, King Ahasuerus had his ring and that probably had his seal on it. When Haman came to him, and said, I want to make a decree that uh, there's a group of people living in your kingdom that are, are against your kingdom, and I want to make a decree that they all should be killed. Well, King Ahasuerus took his ring off and gave it to Haman. He gave him his signet of authority so that Haman could literally stamp documents into law with that ring. Once they poured the wax on the document and, sta and placed that ring in there and stamped it with that ring, what Haman was doing was he had the official power of the king in his hand in the form of that ring. What happened later when Esther showed King Ahasuerus that there was a conspiracy against Esther the queen and the Jews to have them all killed. And then Ahasuerus comes in, finds Haman laying on Esther's bed, pleading with her. And he's, what, are you going to lay with my wife right in front of me? So he then takes the ring from Haman and gives it to Mordecai who comes in riding on a white horse like Christ. I love that part. So now who has the authority? Mordecai. He's got the king's authority in his hand. Okay? So anyway, boy, I'm just, I could talk about this stuff all day. So shall he open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And again, think of things that are closed or open in the Bible. Think of things that are shut. 
that cannot be opened. And we'll go through those in a minute. I will fasten him, watch this, in a, as a nail in a sure place. What do you think that points to? The cross. I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang up him, upon him all the glory of his father's house. Are we to glory in the cross? Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. They shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity and the vessels of cups, even to the vessels of flagons. And that day shall the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sh sure place be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. Now, I've mentioned a couple things. Who can name for me some things in the Bible that are shut, sealed, closed, have been opened, unsealed? Yes. The bottomless pit. Why didn't I remember that one? Did I? I don't know if I have it in my notes or not. Turn to Revelation 9. Yeah, I don't know if I put that in my notes or not. Yep. There it is. that when Jesus died he went to the lower parts of the earth which I do believe and he took from Satan the keys of hell and death has anybody ever heard that besides me you've heard that Sandy anybody else Gary you've heard that George you ever heard that did you ever believe it uh oh because I don't know where it is. I haven't found it. Do you know where it is? That he took from, that Satan had the keys of death and hell. And that Jesus, when he went to the lower parts of the earth, took those keys from him. Dig on that. Because I have not. I've not found that in Scripture. I've heard it. But I'm not sure that I can, I'm not sure that I can go along with it. Because I can't find Scripture that says it. I know in this case here, clearly, Jesus has already said, I have the keys. Okay? Uh, yeah. Revelation 3 he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So who's got the keys as of Revelation 9? Christ does. And this star, my opinion is it's Lucifer. I could be another one. But clearly, the key was given to him. He didn't steal it from heaven he didn't steal it from god didn't steal it out of the key drawer or whatever it was clearly given to him and with the intent that he would go and and in fact open up the bottomless pit you wouldn't give a falling angel which this that's what this is this star falling is an angel you would not give this particular angel the key to the bottomless pit unless you intended for him to open the bottomless pit so in this in this sense this angel is doing exactly what God wants yes Ron that's where we are no because Christ never fell he didn't fall from heaven the Bible speaks of his um, descending or coming down from heaven but falling is a different thing in the bible and um i may touch on that in the message this morning 
I'm going to preach um, one, maybe two or three messages on going backwards, backsliding, and walking, walking back. I think here the star is Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Okay, that's what I think. But again, I could be wrong. It doesn't, I did, it doesn't particularly identify it as Lucifer. It's just a star that falls from heaven. Anything falling from heaven, well, we know in Revelation 12, a third of the angels are cast out of heaven and they fall to the earth. Okay, uh, Babylon falls, Dagon falls, uh, Judas' body fell. Saul fell, uh, but you don't really see Christ falling anywhere, okay? So if you come up with anything on that, you let me know, because I, I just don't, I don't know, I just don't see that Lucifer or Satan had the keys to begin with, it's just my opinion. And he opened the bottomless pit, verse 2, and there arose a the smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God. There it is, the seal of God in their forehead. And, and again, when Christ seals something, or the Holy Ghost seals something, no man can unseal it meaning because your salvation didn't come from a church your salvation cannot be taken by a church uh, somebody sent me a letter that was from an organization that tries to bring people into the Catholic Church and it was like a seven or eight page fundraising letter saying we need your money bad because the church is losing members. That's what it said. And, uh, but it was basically telling all these stories about how the church and only the church has the authority on earth to forgive men's sins or give men everlasting. And I'm going, no way. Not true. Totally not true. And then it starts talking about all these ministers that have left Protestantism and became Catholic priests. I don't care if they're stupid. It's not my fault. Um, but yeah, the church, the Catholic church teaches that since they can administer salvation and forgiveness, they have the right to take it away if they want. In fact, when they remove you from the mass and say you can no longer have received the the mass anymore they're essentially taking away your salvation they are forbidding you the right for you to have access to the means of salvation through the eucharist and they're saying you can't have it anymore years ago there was a polish catholic church up in st louis and they were they were they held their own bank account and their own property. I don't know how they did it. But for 150 years they had their own building, they had their own property and their own bank account. And it was worth like 10 million dollars. Everything put together, 10 million dollars. Well, the new archbishop of St. Louis decided he wanted it. So he wrote him a letter to the trustees of that church saying, um Sign over your church, your property, and your bank accounts to the archdiocese. And it'll go easy on you. And it was, I'm going, this is a mafia shakedown. And the, the church wrote back and said, no speak English. Uh, we're not going to do it. And so the, the archbishop threatened them and said, if you don't sign over, this is over, you know, months the Arch, Archbishop said, if you don't sign over the property and the money and the bank accounts and the keys and everything like that, then we're going to pull your priest. And to those Catholics, that meant you can't have mass and you cannot go to heaven. That wicked Archbishop was going to doom those people of that church to hell in his eyes for not handing over the money. 
And I don't know how, and they said, okay, pull our priest. So they pulled the priest. They made a phone call to Chicago. There's Polish Catholics up there, like thick as dogs here. And them Polish Catholics up there sent the priest down from Chicago. And he was holding illegal mass services in that church. Okay? I don't know how it ever turned out. I didn't, I didn't follow up on it. But that was, to me, that was some of the most wicked doings I've ever seen in my life was this bishop saying, I want the money, give it to me now, or I'm going to take your salvation away from you. I'm going to doom your souls to hell for not signing over. We need that to pay our lawsuits. Okay? Um, but anyway, that, that's the church. If you get your salvation from them, plan on having it revoked at any time. But the truth of it is, nobody can take your salvation away. Turn to, um, who else is, somebody got another one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pilate put his seal on the, on the tomb. Okay. But see, Christ didn't. Just Pilate. Pilate's seal, that tells you something there. Pilate's seal can be broken. Turn to Genesis 7. Yes, George. Daniel. Daniel. To me, it's interesting. Daniel's 27th book of the Old Testament. Revelation's 27th book of the New Testament. Daniel's sealed. Revelation's not. Specifically. God, uh, the angel told John, seal not up the saints. So, for some reason, Revelation is not sealed. But Daniel is. And when you read like the last seven chapters of the book of Daniel, it doesn't even make sense. It's very difficult to comprehend what is being told there in the last seven chapters of the book of Daniel. And I believe it's because the meaning is still sealed up. If, if it's sealed, only Christ can unseal it. Rebel, uh, Genesis chapter 7. Understand this. Get some, get some wisdom out of this. There are those who believe that no amount of wickedness, heinous sins, absolute depravity can undo God's salvation. So there are those who see salvation as a buy one, get everything free. There are those who see salvation as barely hanging by a thread. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe, like in the case of the flood, uh, let's read it in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was open upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day Noah entered, or entered Noah, and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of, of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Who shut the door of the ark? God did. Who only has the right to open it? Only God. God said, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And I will pardon who I will pardon. God is the one who makes that call. And, God, and it's not like God is trying to exclude anybody. Because all the while the ark was in preparing, men had an opportunity to enter in. Seven days before the flood. God tells Noah, you and your family, go into the ark for yet seven days and I will destroy the earth. They had seven days to figure it out. No man entered in, but Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, they alone entered in and all the animals. And once God shut that door, 
If you watched the uh, movie Noah, it came out a couple years ago, that just made me mad. Because it had one of the evil guys hiding out in the ark during the flood. And I'm going, that's no, nah, no. That didn't happen that way. And a good illustration that I heard used was uh, some people think that God told Noah to drive a peg in the side of the ark and hang on for a year. That's not how it was. Where was Noah? He was in the ark. And who shut him in there? God did. Meaning Noah wasn't going to fall out. I used to get tickled at Lindsay when she was little. I used to ride around with my window down and my arm out the window. And Lindsay was little and she was afraid I was going to fall out of the window of the car. Driving around like that. She started crying. Lisa said, why are you crying? And she, she told me, she said, dad's going to fall out. I didn't fall out of the car, not that day, and uh, I'm not going to fall out of the ark. If, you're, if God has you in, He seals you and He shuts you in. And no man can open that back up and take that away from you. If you look in chapter 8, verse 13... And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, and on the seventh month, and 20, 20th day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth to the ark. Only God can tell Noah. God is the one who told Noah to get in. God's the only one who can tell him to leave. Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may, be, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl that, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. God is the one who commanded this event to take place meaning God is the only one he's the one since he's the one that shut the door God is the only one who can open the door and allow Noah and the family and the animals out I'm going to give you some encouragement for the bell rings while I'm thinking about it whatever you have that's valuable to you that's precious to you that you never want to lose Give it to God and ask God to shut it up for you. If you'll do that, God will bless that and He will keep that which you have committed unto Him against that day. Um, who has a safety deposit box? Probably most everybody here. You're asking the bank, you pay them a couple bucks a month, and you're asking the bank to hold your most valuable possessions. P important papers, documents, titles, things like that. So that nobody can get to them, nobody can alter them, nobody can steal them, no, no fire can harm it. You can't lose it. That's what will happen with me. I'll lose it. Put it on my desk. It's gone. Okay? That's what happens. And we hand stuff over to a bank and say, hold this for me and until I'm ready for it again. You may have cash money in a safety deposit box. You may have gold. You may have silver in a safe deposit box. But you're asking that bank to secure that and they have to secure it and they, they'll insure it too. They'll guarantee that whatever's in there is there or the worth of it and they're responsible for it since they have it. Whatever's precious to you, your salvation. Don't put your salvation in somebody else's hands and definitely don't put it in your own. 
It is up to you to make sure that you are saved, yes. But then take that and commit it over to God and say, God, don't ever let me fall away. God, don't ever let me turn my back on you. Hold on to this for me and keep it for me. And when you commit that to God, your life, your family, your marriage, your home, uh, we are seeing, we are seeing the loss of important things in this country because we've taken them for granted. Amen. Our rights, our sovereignty as a nation, our freedom as a people, we're seeing those things squandered and cast aside by a younger generation. And it's awful to think of where this country is going to be in another 50 years. But take the things that are most precious to you and commit them over to God and say, God, keep them. I can't do it. I'll fail. God, will you keep these things? Will you seal them up for me? God, will you hold them for me until that day? And I promise you, God will do that. Father, bless your word. Bless these people this morning. Thank you, dear God, that you and you alone have the power to open. No man shutteth. And Father, that applies to this book too. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would give us wisdom and instruction. Teach us, Father, things, dear God, valuable issues of life that the devil wants us to forget about or he replaces with the ideas of this world. Lord, just bless your word in the hearts of your people this morning. Say what I could not say. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.